Hello, Kyola Lucia here, property investment mentor and founder of the Finance Mortgages and Insurance. This is the recording of one hour live webinars. If you would like to join us in our next webinars and be part of the Q&A, please head to our website, luciaxiao.co.nz. I trust you will definitely learn a lot from this video. Thank you. So hi, welcome to uh, tonight's webinar, you know, how to avoid delays in the property purchases. And uh, unfortunately, um, Doya Ping um, isn't well. She's got a bit of sore throat. So uh, Jeff had to actually, <laughs> you know, like uh, uh, come in and rescue that, you know, the, um, this. Yeah, so, so, um, so Jeff, I think I'll probably give you a bit of like an introduction uh, for uh, Jeff. Jeff actually has uh, nearly 30 years experience as a lawyer specializing in the uh, litigation and dispute resolution. So for the past 30 years, uh, Jeff has worked in a large, uh, long established law firm, has been in house counselor and for 18 years run his own practice prior to join uh, PCW Road as a director. Um, so joining us today is Jeff. So I'm probably going to uh, let you take over from here. Yeah. Thank All right. You. Hello, mm. everyone. Um, thank you for the introduction, Lucia. My name is Jeff Usher. I am a partner slash director at PCW Law Limited. Uh, as Lucia has mentioned, my co-director Ping uh, is unfortunately unwell, unable to present this seminar tonight. So what I'll be focusing on is um, how to make your property purchases go smoothly by ensuring that you have everything that you need to complete the AML requirements. So as we go, if anybody's got any questions, please feel free to post them in the chat box there. Uh, I have uh, got the chat box up there, so I'll do a bit of an introduction, a little bit of a description of what AML is all about, and then happy to uh, have some discussions with you. A lot of you, if you have uh, purchased properties before, and if you've done so since July 2018, you'll be pretty familiar with AML requirements. Some of you may not. As uh, Lucia said, I've got 30 years experience as a lawyer, mainly doing litigation and dispute resolution. Uh, and also for my sins, I am the AML Compliance Officer at PCW Law Limited, which means I am responsible for ensuring compliance of the firm and compliance of our clients with AML requirements. Now, AML is the shortened uh, name for what is required under the Anti-Money Laundering and Countering Financing of Terrorism Act, which is a real mouthful and is something that New Zealand has enacted in the last few years because most countries uh, have essentially agreed together to enact legislation which is supposed to, whether it does in practice, I don't know, but it is supposed to assist with um, making money laundering a lot more difficult and making the financing of terrorism a lot more difficult. But it, what it also means in practical terms is it can make our lives uh, quite a bit more difficult in terms of what we need to provide when we are opening a bank account or dealing with a finance company or undertaking certain um, transactions through our lawyers and in, particularly, uh, in particular with property purchases. So the main institutions that are required to carry out what's called AML checks are banks uh, and finance companies, and a lot of you will have experienced that if you've had to open uh, a bank account in the last couple of years, you will know that the bank asks you a lot of questions about your identity, where you live, what your source of wealth is, what your source of finance is. Since July 2018, that is also something that lawyers have had to ask of all their clients in respect of what's called captured services. Not every service that a lawyer provides needs to have clients um, satisfy AML requirements. For example, in the area of litigation or dispute resolution, uh, we do not necessarily have to 
go through AML requirements if you are involved, for example, in a dispute with your neighbour or suing someone to recover a debt. But when it comes to commercial transactions and property transactions, AML requirements are something that you need to comply with every time. Now, there are certain basic requirements for AML, and AML is focused on you as the client or as the person who is undertaking the transaction. So if, for example, you were to come to our firm and you want to purchase a property uh, this month and it's the first time that we've acted for you, we will undertake AML checks on you. If, however, next month or in six months' time you come to us and you also want to purchase a property or sell a property, we don't need to go through that every single time. AML is tagged to you as the client rather than a transaction. But there are three essential requirements for AML. And the first is identity. So we are required as lawyers or if we're a bank, we're required uh, as a bank to establish your identity. Normally that is done by uh, obtaining some sort of official photographic identification and usually that is your passport. Sometimes it is your driver's license, but preferably it is your passport and usually it needs to be a current passport, not an expired passport. What your lawyer will do at that stage is uh, cite the original of your passport and then keep a photocopy and certify the copy of your passport as being a, um, a certified copy and that is then kept on file to establish your identity and that is of course making sure that you are who you say you are. The next uh, thing that we need to verify is your place of residence. That is something that is usually established by way of say a bank statement if your bank statement is posted to your residential address or for example a utility statement such as a power bill. Those are the usual ways of establishing where you live. So in order to satisfy those first two heads for AML, we need to identify who you are and where you live. Then the next uh, element that we need to establish, and this is very important when it comes to property purchases, uh, less important when it comes to property sales, but for property purchases, we need to establish what's called your source of wealth and your source of funds. So for example, we uh, would need, if you are purchasing a property, we would need to see um, bank statements showing your income. If you are on a salary, uh, sometimes we need to see what is in uh, your, you know, the balance in your bank account. Essentially what you need to do is satisfy us and we need to be reasonably satisfied of um, your source of wealth, your source of income, so that we can um, be sure that you have not acquired your income through means that are not allowed, for example, through um, money laundering, through um, crime or through other, um, other unlawful means. Now, sometimes uh, establishing source of wealth is uh, relatively easy and in fact not sometimes most of the time that is something which is relatively straightforward we can see bank statements recent bank statements we can see uh, proof of your uh, salary for example but um, we act as a firm for many many Chinese clients for example some of them are reasonably new to the country um, now putting aside um, restrictions that such people will face on buying residential property in New Zealand. If, for example, we're wanting to buy a commercial property, it can be uh, quite difficult to establish what the client's source of wealth is or their source of income if they have not uh, recently been earning money or built up um, significant wealth in New Zealand. So what we often will have to do is obtain uh, from China, uh, audited statements, for example, in relation to a client's business in China or uh, bank statements in China, uh, setting up uh, what the client's um, income has been. Often um, what we obtain is bank statements showing the client's salary. 
going into their Chinese bank accounts. Now, sometimes that can be reasonably straightforward, but what we always have to be aware of is the uh, potential delays if we are obtaining financial information from overseas, not only in terms of actually uh, getting copies of those documents and making sure, for example, that we, need, that we have audited um, statements uh, by your accountant in China, but also, of course, we have the language issue. If documents are in Chinese, uh, for example, then it is often necessary to get those translated. Uh, now, we have a number of Chinese-speaking staff here, so that is an advantage at PCW Law because we're able to um, have staff immediately look at um, immediately look at uh, documentation and establish whether or not it, it says what it says uh, or it, it um, says what it is supposed to say. Uh, my co-director Ping Chen for many, many years worked as a uh, prosecutor in, in China and for a time as a police officer in China. So she has got a lot of experience in dealing with, uh, in dealing with uh, government agencies in China and dealing with financial institutions in China and she's very good at having a look at documentation that you might have received uh, from China uh, and, whether, and whether that is enough to satisfy our requirements for establishing source of wealth or source of funds. Now I see we've got a um, question there in the chat room, EDD requirements, that's enhanced due diligence requirements for sale of a family trust property. So thank you for that. That's a very good question. I will get to that shortly because what I've talked about so far is establishing your identity as a person uh, and your place of residence as a person. And of course, everything that we deal with, whether it's a company or whether it's a trust, for example, has people behind it. But there are particular requirements, of course, when you come to uh, entities such as companies or trusts. So using companies by way of example, uh, it is necessary to do what's called customer due diligence, that is identification and address on all directors of a company, uh, on any shareholders who hold 25% or more shares in the company, anyone who has authority to act in relation to bank accounts of a company and has who, who has signing authority. In other words, anyone who's got effective control over that company. So again, just a tip, if you uh, have a company and that company is involved in a property transaction or a commercial transaction and there is some urgency, but there is a need because you haven't uh, engaged with this particular lawyer before to undertake AML, uh, checking, then it is important to make sure that uh, you've got uh, the names and addresses and identity documents for everybody who might fit into those categories of directors, people who are 25% shareholders or more, and anyone who's in effective control of the company. Now for smaller companies, of course, um, that's usually the directors of the company. But of course, for larger companies, you may have someone who's neither a director nor a shareholder, but is, for example, the CEO or is the general manager. That person may be uh, somebody, if they, if they are in effective control of the company, that is somebody that we may also need to do customer due diligence on. Check their identity, check their place of residence. And then, of course, in relation to the company, we also need to undertake source of wealth and source of income. One of the other things <clears throat> that we need to undertake uh, is what's called um, whether or not somebody is a politically exposed person, PEP. That is another requirement of the AML legislation and what we do is we subscribe to a uh, to a online service which provides uh, what's called PEP checks. Every time we conduct AML on an individual, we will put their name into the database and check whether they are a PEP. Now, PEP is what's called politically exposed persons. 
So that means that if you are, for example, somebody who is in government in a country and not necessarily New Zealand or in an overseas country, or if you have relatives who are um, in government in a uh, in New Zealand or in another country, or if uh, you have relatives who are judges, for example, who, who are a judge in another country, uh, all of these uh, uh, are what's called politically exposed persons. And those are people that um, Department of Internal Affairs in New Zealand requires to um, requires us to undertake checks on because they see those people who have those sorts of political connections or connections with the judiciary as being somebody who is potentially exposed to the risk of corruption or blackmail. Now, again, it all seems very, very um, remote if you're just somebody who wants to buy a house in Epsom uh, to have these sorts of uh, checks done to see whether or not you have some sort of international connections or you're a politically exposed person. And again, um, we may question how um, we may question how effective the law is or whether it makes any difference whatsoever to the uh, fighting of terrorism or trying to reduce money laundering. But uh, the law is something that we have to follow and those are the checks that we need to undertake. Now, coming back to the question for the uh, issue of trusts. Trusts are something where you have to do what's called enhanced due diligence. Whether, whether a trust is uh, selling a property or buying a property or whether you are setting up a family trust, you need to do, uh, you need to have the name and date of birth of all trustees and set laws. Set laws are the people who set up the trust. Trustees are the people who run the trust in effect. They are the people who uh, deal with it on a day-to-day -day basis. You need to verify the identity and address of uh, all trustees who are authorised to act on behalf of the trust. In relation to beneficiaries, if there are fewer than 10 beneficiaries, you need to have the name and date of birth of all beneficiaries, but you do not need to go through the process of verifying the identity and address of all beneficiaries. Because you are undertaking enhanced due diligence, which is due diligence, uh, which is uh, go, has to go further than the normal checks that you would do, you are required to get full details of the source of funds for the trust. Now, sometimes the source of funds for the trust will come from the set laws or it will come from uh, properties that are being transferred into the trust. Now, sometimes you can have issues arising with AML, which can cause you real problems. And I will give you a case example. Uh, for example, uh, over the last couple of days, and we've managed to resolve this issue today, uh, we have a client who is purchasing a property in New Zealand for a reasonably large amount of money, uh, around about $5 million. Unfortunately, due to some communication issues with their previous lawyer, uh, AML requirements for the finance company that is providing the mortgage for them to buy the property uh, were not properly communicated and we were left in a position where uh, settlement is coming up uh, tomorrow and finance has still not been approved because the finance company was not satisfied as to the uh, source of wealth of the um, of the clients. Now the issue that we have with that is that these clients are very very wealthy people and they have many, many assets and a lot of money in New Zealand. But the finance company was saying to us, in order to satisfy our AML requirements, we must see the source of funds in China, which is where these people's money originally came from. Now, even though that was more than 15 years ago, that is something that the uh, finance company was insistent of. So. So, of course, this is causing a huge amount of stress for our clients who are required to settle tomorrow. If they are not able to settle, then they are going to be facing very, very stiff penalties. 
under the uh, sale and purchase agreement for every day that they are uh, unable to settle. In the end, uh, we were able to uh, get some documentation uh, from China showing some compensation paid by the government uh, to our clients uh, some time ago. It was a significant amount of money that was paid to our clients. We sent that off to the finance company and thankfully they have come back and said, yes, we accept that as proof of uh, wealth of your uh, clients. So we were able to get that sorted out for our clients and they uh, should be able to settle the property purchase tomorrow. But you can see the importance there of making sure that AML is dealt with at a very early stage. Really, as soon as you engage with your lawyer, any AML issues need to be dealt with. And if you're dealing with a bank or a finance company in particular, they also have AML requirements that they must undertake. Uh, and it wasn't enough for this finance company to know that our client had significant amounts, you know, millions of dollars sitting in bank accounts in New Zealand, which of course uh, the banks themselves would have already undertaken AML on. Uh, and so, but the finance company's response to that was, no, we still must undertake our independent AML checks. However, um, with a bit of stress and a bit of uh, creative thinking and uh, putting together our collective experience, we were able to get that result for the client where they are now in a position to settle. Yeah, so we got a, another question from Keith is that if the beneficiary is actually named, who CDD need? I don't know, did you answer this one or? Uh, no, normally we do. Sorry, I've. Can you? <laughs> you just accidentally hiding yourself. I've dropped out. No, my connection seems low at the moment. So you're on audio. Oh. Sorry, guys. I have uh, an internet issue. Hopefully, that'll resolve itself shortly. Can you? Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. 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 No problem. Uh, yeah. yeah. No. Look, if the beneficiary is named, you don't need full CDD on the beneficiary. Like I said, if you've got ten or few, if, if you've got ten or fewer beneficiaries, you need the name and the date of birth of those beneficiaries, but you don't need to undertake customer due diligence on the beneficiaries. What you need uh, to to do is make sure that the uh, trustees and the settlers have had customer due diligence undertaken on them. Okay, right. I do have another question here is that when you're talking yeah. about the, um, uh, the identity, Mm -hmm. And it's quite interesting that we do come across some customers that they don't have a passport, they don't have yep. a driver's license. All they have was a birth certificate, yeah. Yeah, that is a very, very difficult because you need to have your photographic identity. Um, now, just remind me, does the China uh, identification card have photographic identity on it? I mean, they are not necessarily Chinese. I, think they oh, I understand that, but, but sometimes, yeah. yeah. Uh, because we have a lot of clients from China, they've got their China identity card. But really, these days, we do need to have photographic identity because a birth certificate is not going to be enough. We need to satisfy ourselves that you are who you say you are. And we have seen previously people who come to us pretending to be someone that they are not. Oh, really? <laughs> so, True. Yes, it has happened. And and we've had to say, sorry, bud, <laughs> you are not this person. My but, God. I know. You know, sometimes, and, 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 and terrible though it is, sometimes it's a family member, you know, son or daughter comes along and wants, pretends to be mum. Sometimes that's without mum or dad's consent. Sometimes it's with mum or dad's consent because mum and dad don't speak English. It's just easier to send someone along to pretend. <laughs> <laughs> get it across the line. So we have to be very, very vigilant about that. Mm. Um, but yes, you are right. Um, some people don't have a passport and some people don't have a uh, don't driver's, have license. A driver's yeah. license. So I think um, the lesson in that would be if you do not have either of those documents, you do need to try and get some sort of identity document that has your, uh, photo. You know, has your photo ID in it. Yeah. Mm. Uh, okay. So, all right, so we got a question here from one is from Mio. Yeah, so if the remote situation, the ML checks find some form of uh, deception, is that reported or no. is. No, we are required to provide what's called uh, suspicious transaction reports to the uh, to DIA. 
and that that is compulsory if there is some sort of transaction where we think oh this may have um you know money laundering or terrorism elements to it we are uh, the only one um exception to that is we are not required to breach privilege of our clients in other words we are not required to do anything which would um, break what's called solicitor client privilege which is the sort of absolute confidentiality we have between lawyer and client but anything outside that we are required to file suspicious transaction reports okay o on the other hand um if it's just a question of identity and it isn't a transaction um then the answer would normally just be go away <laughs> we haven't said <laughs> we're not satisfied <laughs> that you are who you say you are okay is it answer your question mio um and then we got uh the other one is from keys yeah so yeah. Uh, if an overseas company has more than 25 percent shareholdings in the New Zealand company selling a property than EDD, I guess. Uh, yeah, well, we certainly need, I mean, the overseas company is still someone that we are going to need to do AML checks on. And again, that's something which is not necessarily challenging in terms of the logistics, but in terms of timing, it's something to be aware of. You don't want to sort of turn up at your lawyers and say, look, I've, you know, I'm settling in two days time. <laughs> and we then need to somehow try and do uh, due diligence on a on an overseas company which is a shareholder of that New Zealand company. Like most things, if you give yourself plenty of time, you can usually find a solution. But it is important to be uh, to be prepared on that. Okay, uh, we've got another question from David. Yeah, so mm. given the ML CFT requirements, I don't know what's CFT. Yeah, uh, blind trusts. Still uh, feasible. Well, yes, C CFT is is um, countering financing of of terrorism. Um, <laughs> there is an issue not only with um, AML with blind trusts, but also under the new um, Trusts Act, uh, there is a lot more transparency required in trusts anyway. So blind trusts are a little bit more difficult to. Um, a little bit more difficult to establish even under um, the new trust law which comes into effect um, next year uh, you know even putting aside the AML requirements so I mean then and, and I mean you could get me started on the <laughs> on the disclosure requirements under trusts uh, under the new trust law as well um, again that's a question of well is it really something which is beneficial uh, to everybody or is it something that is, um, you know, it's the law and you've simply got to follow it? Just to give you an example and just to diverge for a second off the AML requirements, uh, there's a general requirement that all trustees, so all beneficiaries are uh, given basic details of um, a trust to which uh, they are, you know, of which they're a beneficiary. And there, of course, the classic example that's given, given is what about my lazy 17 year old teenage son? If I tell him he's the beneficiary of a trust and he's going to get all this uh, money and property when he's 25, you know, that'll just mean he'll sit, out, sit on his bum all day playing video games. <laughs> So um, there are there are a number of issues um, around uh, transparency and trust, but the reality is the new trust law means that things are going to be a lot more transparent anyway. Um, but I mean, when it comes back to it, any trust we we simply have to do the um, we have to do the the. Uh, enhanced CDD requirements. We have to undertake that identity check. We have to undertake the source of wealth. We have to undertake the um, place of residence check for trustees and set laws uh, regardless. Mm, okay. Mm. I don't know whether you come across this, but I think we do come across one or two clients kind of like having an issue trying to transfer the money from, you know, like from China, from yep. overseas to mm. New Zealand. So what you know, like, and obviously you got all those like foreign exchange companies, and yep. that doesn't seem the way to you know you know like how so you know and we kind of in the position that you know need to actually get customer data advice of like uh, what you know they should do and things like that. So I don't know what will be your advice for that. Yeah. Well, there's, there's two issues. The first is 
actually transferring money and you know it, 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 we have a lot of clients who um you know as things have tightened up in terms of getting money out of china for example it's made things a lot more difficult they may have you know significant assets in china but actually getting it here to new zealand <laughs> is a different story um sorry just but getting back to your question we're talking about using um foreign exchange companies for example to transfer funds i don't think there's a particular issue with that it's it's like anything is making sure that it is completely transparent you've got the documentation the issue from an aml point of view is what is what is the source of that funds those funds i mean how you get it to new zealand i don't think really is is the issue if you're using a foreign exchange company that should generally be fine foreign exchange companies of course are subject to uh, their own aml requirements and very stringent AML requirements, and if you've been following the news, you'll know that some of them have uh, faced very, very significant penalties for failing to comply with AML uh, requirements. Some, mm -hmm. in fact, have faced penalties of millions of dollars where there's not even been a suggestion that they've been involved in money laundering, but they simply haven't fully complied with their AML obligations. And in those circumstances, have ended up with penalties of millions of dollars, even though, you know, they haven't actually been doing the really bad stuff, money laundering. They've simply failed to um, undertake customer due diligence, failed to check source of funds, failed to do the, do the proper checks that they're required to at law. So I think the issue is, is not uh, the use of foreign exchange companies. The issue will be satisfying a bank or satisfying your lawyer that the source of wealth in in the foreign country is is something which you can prove as being you know genuine and genuinely um generated but whether it's by way of a business whether it's by way of salary oh right okay mm. okay oh that's good yeah that's good to know yeah mm. yeah okay I wonder what else have we got more questions about the um uh for Jeff? Yeah, because Jeff is actually he just um been going to the court for the whole day. Uh so it's quite a, a busy lawyer. This is this is a pleasant break. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so um yeah, if anyone has got any particular issues or if anyone is is, you know, looking to buy a property at the moment, for example, I'd be interested to see what sort of things that you uh you would like to know. Yeah, I don't know, Jeff, do you have any other like case studies that maybe you can share with uh, you know, like the audience or yeah I mean I, I think again uh, one of the one of the issues is um, one of the issues is verifying source of funds source of wealth from foreign countries I mean our experience generally is with China and again I mean I can give you an example about a year ago we had a client come in who wanted to um, do a particular transaction they brought with them a bunch of a uh, documentation from china now of course it means absolutely nothing to me <laughs> as the aml compliance office <laughs> <laughs> i yeah. cannot read anything but ping with her experience was able to simply sit down at the table go through all of these documents look at them understand exactly what they were understanding exactly what they said and not only that, but understanding that, yes, there's, these documents do appear to be genuine because, um, again, Ping's got that experience from having worked in government in China and knowing whether or not something looks um, looks as though it is, it is a genuine financial statement, for example, or a genuine statement from a government entity in China because, of course, the danger is if you do not have that experience, you know, I could go off or another law firm could go off and get the documents translated, but you really don't know whether it's something that has genuinely come from a government agency in China or generally come from, genuinely come from a bank in China or whether it's something that somebody's cleverly just forged. It can be very, very difficult sometimes to really get to the bottom of that. And I mean, it, it's a question of, I mean, AML to some extent is a question of risk assessment. And let me give you an example. For example, if um, you are just undertaking a 
fairly standard residential property purchase, then you will get your identity, you will verify your um, place of residence, and you will, you know, do do some checks on source of wealth and source of um, income. But let's say the purchaser is a 19 year old kid and um, you know they're buying a two and a half million dollar property then of course the the red lights go on and you at that point need to say okay um, there are some flags here that we need to investigate further what is the source of wealth what is the source of income now if it's a 60 year old who's been in business in china for 30 years those sorts of red flags don't go up. But a 19 year old kid walking in and saying, I want to buy this two and a half million dollar property, you do need to make sure that you are drilling down into what their source of wealth is. Now, often it's very legitimate. Um, it's sometimes it's simply it's come from mum and dad. Um, but sometimes, of course, these days, one has to be very careful. You see lots of kids driving around in Lamborghinis and every now and then you see the police with their tow trucks. <laughs> and, and, and their, <laughs> their armed response teams taking away the Lamborghinis and the Porsches because they are saying that they have been purchased, for example, with drugs, drug oh. money. And uh, we are involved and we, we act for people who are uh, accused of having um, accumulated their, uh, their wealth through illicit means and 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 the difficulty that you have with that and again i'm digressing slightly from aml but the difficulty you have with that is the police do not even need to get a conviction they do not need to charge you if they charge you and they prosecute you they have to prove beyond reasonable doubt to a court that you have um you know been dealing drugs or whatever it is that you are charged with but if they want to take your assets all they have to do is prove to what's called the civil standard i.e more likely than not 51 percent that your houses for example have been purchased from um dealing drugs or you know prostitution or whatever the you know the illegal activity is and they don't even have to prove that you bought all of you know your assets it just has to be tainted just has to have some of some of the purchase uh having been funded from those illegal means and then they they, they can happily potentially take away all of your cars all of your houses <laughs> we've even had issues with uh, somebody who um had not declared all of his tax and and so therefore the ird through the commissioner of police took action and said look you bought all these houses um and and that is through you know illegal means you didn't declare all of your tax from your business so therefore you've purchased through using illegal funds and thanks very much we'll have your houses yeah i don't know about is the ird it's quite i can hear the feedback there uh i don't know about with ird it's kind of like uh, you you are guilty until you can prove that you are innocent because mm. we're dealing with some customer come to us and had to sorting out the you know the uh the investigation into their tax or something it's yes. really difficult yeah it is difficult whenever you are facing a government agency that's right they have all the cards stacked in their favor again that's why you know we we may not like the law we may not necessarily agree that aml laws are effective but they are the law and we mm. have to comply with them and we have to be very careful to comply with them because if we don't then we can face some fairly serious consequences from government agencies which have all the funding and all the power to make life very, very unpleasant for us. Mm. We got me or saying that uh, Kim.com, there's a good example here, I think. Yes. We don't know. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, he's he's just about used up all his, <laughs> all his avenues now. Um, yeah. Although Kim.com's example is... Yeah, slightly different. That's to do with allegations that his companies were breaching, uh, breaching copyright. And it's really the issues around Kim.com are whether he should be deported to the United States to face uh, face trial for uh, having breached copyright and uh, allowing uh, movies and music and whatnot to be uploaded through his uh, through his previous company. So we've got Mio here. I've noticed some lawyers, finance companies, use independent companies to review AML. Uh, it is not something which is a requirement. We have very, very um, good AML processes in-house. Um, as I said, I am the AML compliance officer. So we do not use um, independent companies uh, to carry out our day-to-day -day AML. Um, what we do do 
uh, is we use, as I've said before, we use the PEP database um, through a company called Centrix to undertake what um, check politically exposed person checks. We also have had a couple of uh, independent audits ourselves. When we when the AML requirements first came in, we were randomly selected by DIA to do what's called a desk audit to have a look at our um, risk assessment and our compliance program. And we were very happy to find uh, that we passed that with flying colours. We were in the top 10% of lawyers who were audited at that time. Then uh, last year, we had our uh, what's called our AML audit, which is um, a requirement to have your AML processes independently audited by somebody who is not part of your company. So in that case, yes, we used an independent AML auditor. Very pleased again to report that we were the first of their clients to actually pass their audit. <laughs> so um, we, are, we are very, very satisfied that our processes are stringent and robust. But even though we don't uh, use independent contractors for most of our AML vetting, we are obviously independently audited uh, as required under the AML. Um, regulations. And then we've got yeah. we've got Echo here. If I receive financial help from an overseas parent, what documents are needed to comply with AML? Um, well, normally what we would need to see obviously is evidence of where that money came from. So, in some ways, we are essentially conducting AML on your parents, even if your parents are not our clients. We would need to verify the source of wealth or the source of funds uh, from your parents uh, uh, for in the overseas company. Again, that would mean looking at potentially uh, audited bank statements of a company that's been trading for some time. It would look at potentially sale and purchase agreements and settlement statements for sale of property in that overseas company. It may involve looking at bank statements um, if your parents' income is largely for salaries for example. So in a way, you are doing a de facto AML check on the parents at that point. So thank you so much for um, joining us today, tonight. Yeah, Jeff, yeah. I don't know, have you got any last words you want to say or, yeah? Mm -hmm. No, just thank you, uh, everybody who's tuned in on what's a beautiful summer night. I'm sure you've got lots of other things you could have uh, been doing tonight. So thank you very much. I'm very happy that you've decided to join us. Um, and I hope that uh, the information that we've provided tonight is of some use to you. As Lucia says, uh, very happy for you to just click on that link. And if you've got any further questions or inquiries, just fire off an inquiry to the website or uh, send me an email or um, there should be details on the website. So thank you very much. Hope yeah. everyone has a good, good evening. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jeff. Yeah. All right. See ya. Okay. See you Bye. later, everybody. Bye-bye. Yeah.